Hello and welcome to another edition of Telescope Man. <clears throat> Tonight uh, we're going <clears> to <throat> do something a little different. We're going to show you a bunch of telescope accessories. Now, remember, you don't have to have all these accessories in order to enjoy the hobby of astronomy and to uh, get yourself called an amateur astronomer. You don't have to buy all this stuff, but some of the, the things I'm going to show you tonight are very useful out in the field uh, when you're observing the night sky. So let's go through them and uh, I'll explain the use of each one and then uh, kind of tell you where you can find it or where you can buy it. And uh, so get your pencils and papers out because here we go with telescope accessories. Telescope accessories. So you've gone out and you've bought your first telescope and uh, could be a refractor style, it could be a reflector style, or it could be what's called a catadioptric, which is a folded light style telescope, like a Schmidt Cassegrain. Um, You've already bought that telescope, and you might have gotten a few accessories with this scope. You know, more than likely, you got a tripod of some sort. Um, you know, folks make tripods that you can buy as a separate item that are much more heavy duty than probably the one that came with your lower cost scope if it's your first scope. Uh, so you can always upgrade the tripod, but most more than likely you received a tripod and maybe one or two uh, low-cost eyepieces, probably in 1.25 inch size is probably what you got along with the scope. Scope probably came with some sort of little finder scope, um, might might be a good finder scope, might be not so good, but it probably came with some sort of finder scope or what we call a red dot finder, which projects an image of the red dot in the reticle out onto the sky, and you basically use it like a uh, heads-up display gun sight, and you use that to point the scope uh, exactly at a point in the night sky. So you pr might have these already. So let's talk with some uh, talk about some other things that you may need. Now the first one we're going to talk about is this little bitty bubble level that I bought at Home Depot for about four dollars. And this is a very important accessory for you, especially if you have a go-to scope or an equatorial mount that you must level the tripod on to begin with. So if you have one of those two kinds of uh, mounts, you, the first thing you're going to do when you take it outside is you're going to use a bubble level of some sort to level that tripod uh, so that it's perfectly level and horizontal. So you can go to, uh, you know, Home Depot, a hardware store somewhere, pick yourself up this little bitty two-way, see it's got a bubble this way and a bubble this way, so you can just lay it on the head of the tripod and use it to adjust the leg so that you've got it perfectly uh, horizontal and level. So that's one thing you're going to have to have if you have uh, a go-to scope or an equatorial mount. You're going to have to run out and get yourself one of those. Also, it's real handy to have a compass with you. Just simply so you know 
uh, within a few degrees of where is north. Okay, where is north? Now, if you've got an equatorial mount and some go-tos, you can use this compass to get a rough alignment on true north. Okay, this is magnetic north, this compass. Uh, what you really want is true north, and every site has what's called magnetic deviation. And you can Google that, you know, for your city. You could type in something like uh, Dallas, Texas, magnetic deviation. And, uh, or you can go to Google Maps and click on exactly where you are. And I believe it also gives a magnetic deviation from there. But these can range anywhere from 1 or 2 degrees to 10 or 12 or 14 degrees. It depends on, um, you know, where you are on the Earth's surface. So um, you could be way away from what's called the celestial pole, which is the exact axis of rotation of the Earth, which in some cases would be exactly the same as what your compass says north is, and in other cases it could be 10 degrees off. So you need to know your uh, magnetic de deviation east or west of true north. And then you can use this compass and get a pretty good rough alignment onto the actual rotation of the earth if you have an equatorial mount for example so go to walmart or somewhere buy yourself a liquid filled uh, uh, compass and put that in your eyepiece bag along with your bubble leveler now a lot of you have never seen this little pin-like device that I'm holding right here. Okay, a little pin-like device. And uh, it's called a lens pin. And if you Google lens pin, L-E-N-S-P-E-N, -E -E uh, you you'll go right to their site. And uh, you, you can purchase one of these for 10 or $12, something like that. And they are excellent to use to clean your eyepiece. Now, there's some debate in the hobby about these things, uh, destroying eyepieces, and they're not very good. And, you know, I would never do that to my eyepiece, et cetera, et cetera. Most of that is baloney. Uh, many people in our astronomy club use this pen to clean their ethos and Nagler eyepieces, which cost $400 and up. All right? So they're not afraid to use this lens pen. The trick to using it is one end has a retractable brush on it. See it? Can you see that going up and down? All right? So what you want to do is you want to use this brush to... Uh, and I've got an eyepiece right here. You want to use this brush to kind of brush off the eyepiece and make sure that there's no dust and dirt particles on there because that's what will scratch the coating on there is having dirt uh, and dust particles, big ones that will scratch that coating. What most uh, folks don't realize is the coatings on these eyepieces are very similar to the coatings on a camera lens, like a Nikon camera lens. Okay, they're relatively tough. Now, the coatings on a mirror that's in your telescope, if you happen to have a reflector uh, style telescope with a mirror in it, those are very delicate. And you cannot use this lens pen on a mirror. But for a camera lens or for a um, eyepiece lens, like this one I'm holding here, 
you can use this to clean it. So the first step is to brush it off. Then you retract it, and it has an other, the other end has a cap on it. You kind of rotate it a little bit because there's a solid cleaning substance in the bottom of this cap. You pull it out, and it's got a little um, chamois type tip on it. You take this and you gently run it across the eyepiece in a circular motion. And what I do is when I go all the way around, I pull it down across the middle, not applying a lot of force. Okay, and I can tell you, it's going to be difficult to show you on the camera, but this eyepiece is outstanding right now. It is perfectly clear. Okay, absolutely perfectly clear. Now, here's the other trick to use with it. When you have kids and you're at, or you you might be at a public observing event where there's kids and they put their finger on there, or they stick their eye right in it and their eyelash oil gets all over the uh, lens. A lot of uh, quote dirt is only water solu soluble. All right, so what you do is the old trick. Again, rotate it a little bit, pull it out, blow on it just a tiny bit, and that will get off uh, debris that might be water soluble. Okay? Now, if you have bubble gum or chocolate on here, you're going to have to use a different method. You're going to have to use... Uh, uh, regular camera lens cleaning solution that works very well uh, there's some uh, Zeiss lens cloths they're actually tissues available at Walmart those work very well if it's exceptionally dirty and you're gonna have to use that and some q-tips to actually get the uh, stuff that's on there off if it's just tons of it some kid you know uh, was eating bubble gum and now you've got bubble gum juice on your eyepiece you're going to have to use a little bit more than just this lens pen but for normal use i carry this around with me out into the field just in case i see a fingerprint or something on there i can pull it out and in just a few seconds, I have cleaned the eyepiece with this lens pen. Again, the precaution you need to take is to brush the lens off first with the real soft brush that comes with this. Make sure there's no uh, dust or dirt on the glass. And then you can use the other end to clean it up literally better than new. Okay, so I recommend these, and there's some folks in the industry that don't, and they can go ahead and do whatever they want to do, and I will continue to use this because um, you can use this anywhere. You can carry it anywhere very easily and uh, do the job very fast. So a lens pen. Now, I caution you. You go to Amazon, you're going to see 14 different ones of this lens pen, uh, probably from China or Taiwan or somewhere. They look just like this, but and they may even have the in the description a lens pen, all right? There is only one real lens pen, and it's sold on the lens pen site. Let me give you that uh, actual address, uh, www.simacorp.com, and that's spelled S-I-M-A-C-O-R-P. But you can reach it just by uh, Googling Lens Pen, and you will know when you're at the regular site because they'll show you how to use this. They've got videos of how to use it etc etc the other sites don't have that okay and they 
refer to themselves as the original lens pin. Okay, so be sure to buy the real lens pin. Uh, probably what's happened is these people have gone and bought some knockoff that has some substance inside of here that is not what lens pin is using exactly as a solid cleaner and that gets all over the lens and what they'll say is oh it leaves uh, black stuff on the lens well that, that's not a lens pin doing that that's one of these knockoff pins okay the next item I want to show you is kind of a little neat device by um, Astro Gizmos G-I-Z-M-O-S Astro Gizmos and <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, this is the lowest cost, cheapest tripod leg uh, indicator, red indicator, that I have ever found on the internet. You get like four of these for 10 bucks or something like that. And of course, it's a blinking uh, LED light with a little bitty replaceable battery. You can replace that those batteries that are in the bo bottom of this thing. And it's got some Velcro on it, around it. And what you do is you undo the Velcro, you strap this to the tripod leg. Now, some people have three of them, you know, one on each leg, and that way you can see the leg at night. Uh, that's a good practice to follow and then people won't uh, be so uh, when it's dark you know they trip over the leg and mess up your alignment or mess up the scope or fall or something like that I usually just use one of them and I actually hang it from the middle of the eyepiece tray that's you know in between the legs I just hang it there through one of those eyepiece uh, holders and turn it on and uh, you know you can see the tripod from all the way across the field but it does not the light is not bright enough to affect your night vision and it's red okay so a lot of us use these uh, for a safety device uh, on the telescope at night okay and again google uh, Astro Gizmos, G-I-Z-M-O-S. Now he makes a, another red light device that's kind of neat. Uh, same, same company makes this. And it's a clip on one end and a red light on the other end, okay? So clip on one end and a red light on the other and what's neat about it is you can clip this on your laptop screen so you clip this down on your laptop screen and you turn this light on this little stalk any any way you want and it stays and you can light up your keyboard at night with a little red light so you can see the keyboard I, I don't know about most of you but I am uh, uh, typing challenged <laughs> and I use the two finger method so if I can't actually see the keyboard I'm in big trouble so here's the little red light you can see I'm gonna shine it on you right there all right it's really not that bright and uh, again it's probably not gonna affect your night vision one way or the other it's a nice dark dark red uh, LED light and it point it right at the keyboard and you can see what you're doing in the dark with your computer again um, Astro Gizmo sells this and I, I want to remember if this was five dollars I think it was five dollars I'm trying to remember I've had it for a long time but it wasn't very much so another handy accessory now, <clears throat> there's another company by the name of Scopestuff.com. Scopestuff.com. S-C-O-P-E-S-T-U-F-F. -F. They have hundreds 
of odds and ends that astronomers are looking for. I mean, everything from a wireless Bluetooth adapter to this little power plug, okay? Now, I need a power plug because I run all of my go-to scopes off a separate 12-volt power pack with a cigarette lighter style plug on it and the appropriate plug on the other end for that telescope, for that mount. Okay, so Celestron's plug is different. The little part that plugs into the telescope is different than the Mead plug. So uh, you can't use a Mead plug with a Celestron or vice versa. It won't work. So you got to buy the appropriate power plug and then you plug this in right here, this this big uh, cigarette lighter into the 12 volt socket on the power pack and then you plug the little uh, little plug in into the scope mount and then that's how you get your power there. Scopestuff.com sells these for basically all the scopes that are out there. So you can go there if you need a power plug and get one of those. We're going to touch on a little bit about filters. Now, <clears throat> let me just say, I own all the filters you've ever heard of, okay? I got a complete selection of color filters, all right? I have a uh, night sky filter. Uh, I've got a oxygen 3 filter. I've got an ultra contrast filter. I've got a contrast booster filter. I've got a moon filter. All right. And I've got a um, uh, minus violet filter. So I basically have all three nebula filters that you would buy from the um, sky view, I think is what they call it, which is the very mild um, nebula filter, all the way to the O3, oxygen 3 filter, and the ultra contrast, which is kind of in between. Plus, I have every one of the colored filters. When I first got in the hobby, you know, I was reading about uh, colored filters are going to help you see things that you can't see on some of the planets. So I went out and bought every one of them that are normally sold in all the colors and tried to use them. And let me just say, they help to a very minor degree, in my opinion. All right. Everybody that has these, uh, and I will guarantee you that almost every astronomer has these somewhere at home, and probably used them two or three times and then never used them again, just like I did. So the color filters, I would recommend that uh, if you're out at an observing event and somebody has some, just check out a color on a planet that might be up, some colors, see what you think. But I think you're going to agree with me that the color filters are worthless. And... <laughs> The best thing you could do with them is uh, put an ad on Astro Mark and sell them. All right. Now, the nebula filters are a little bit different. Um, I would say that the uh, Sky View filter or Sky Glow filter, you know, who, whichever manufacturer makes it, they have a name for it Sky Glow filter. This is the mildest one. I really don't see a use for that in visual observing, okay, that one. However, there is some use for the ultra contrast sold by Lumicon, uh, Mead, uh, and several other people. The ultra contrast and the oxygen 3, the O3 filter. There are some objects that... Um, Visually, you're not going to see them unless you have one of these two filters. So uh, my advice would be, over time, try to buy yourself a um, nebula filter. 
And guess what I pulled out of here, because I keep it in here with the color filters because I never use it. I pulled out the sky glow filter. <laughs> and there it is. All right. You can see it right there. See how shiny that surface is. It blocks certain wavelengths of uh, street lights. Street lights, the yellow street lights. This blocks it supposedly, but I've really, it's, it's uh, really hasn't helped me very much observe things that I couldn't observe without it. Okay. And the bad part about nebula filters is if you have a very small aperture telescope, let's say you have a three inch refractor, it's very doubtful uh, from a city location you're going to be able to use an O3 filter because it darkens the sky so much and basically takes away what little light gathering power the little three inch refractor has and that it becomes unusual, unusable. So I guess I need to add that um, I'd only recommend these nebula filters for people that have six inches or more of aperture. If you got six or eight or 10 or 12 or 20, yes, uh, the nebula filters you can probably use. But if you have less than six inch, if you got five inch, four inch, maybe with a five inch, maybe. But anything less than five, <clears throat> I would not buy nebula filters for, okay? Now, the one that gets the most use is, of course, the cheapest one. <laughs> and I'd recommend that you buy uh, one of these uh, as soon as you buy your telescope. And it's a plain old moon filter. And all it is is a pair of sunglasses for your eyepiece. That's all it is. It's just a good glass uh, darkened so that the moon won't blind you. Uh, when you look through a telescope and it does increase a little bit of the contrast between the filter between the features uh, on the moon so I would encourage you to just go out get yourself a moon filter probably a 13 uh, you might see some percentages on there get you a 13 percent uh, transmission uh, moon filter okay that's going to darken it up pretty good all right Later you can, uh, or if you want to spend a little more money than just a straightforward 13% filter, then go out and get yourself a variable polarizing moon filter. You can turn the little uh, uh, dial that's on the filter and brighten or darken the image because it's polarized. And, you know, the more you turn it, the darker it gets. You turn it back the other way, and it gets brighter. All right, so those are uh, twice as much as these, okay? These are very cheap. You know, I see them on Astromart all the time for $5. All right, so these are very cheap. The polarizing is going to be 20 or $30, okay, for a... Uh, adjustable polarizing moon filter but that's one that you will use uh, a whole whole lot of especially if you become what we call a lunatic and you do all your observing uh, looking at the moon which there are a lot of people in the hobby that do that so you're going to definitely need a variable polarizing moon filter if you get into observing the moon um, all the time. The next thing I kind of want to show some of you beginners out there is the two sizes, the two general sizes of eyepieces. So you kind of get a feel for the difference in the size okay so here we go let me kind of hold them on the bottom so you can see all right this one's a whole lot bigger than this one right here let me get let me get up here real close on this okay see the difference see the difference okay difference in that glass and this glass etc all right 
Uh, this one, the smaller one, is a 1.25 inch uh, Mead Super Plus All 26 millimeter. All right, pretty good eyepiece for certain kinds of scopes, certain kinds of scopes that we call slow scopes. All right, that'll be in a different. We're not going to get into the types of scopes today, but a Plus All. PL, let me spell that again, P-L-O-S-S-L, a Plossel style eyepiece is pretty good if you have a slow telescope, all right, with an uh, uh, F uh, factor of 10 or more, let's say, or 9 or more, so an F9, F10, F12, F19, whatever it might be. These are going to work real well in there. They won't work so well in fast scopes of less than F6 or F5, all right? They're not going to work as well. And, and, and what will happen is the outer edges of the view will not be in focus. They'll be kind of fuzzy. And when you go to focus, the outside comes in focus and the center goes out of focus. So you can't focus the entire field of view if you tried to use a plossal in a very fast telescope, okay? So that was a 1.25-inch uh, eyepiece. This is a 2-inch eyepiece, okay? 2 inches. Now, obviously, you're going to have to have a 2-inch focuser to put this in there. You know, if you only have a 1.25 inch focuser hole in your focuser, you're not going to be able to put this 2 inch eyepiece in there. These are very good though at low power. You can get a good wide field of view at low power. So I usually use a 2 inch eyepiece from 26 millimeter on up. And then below 26 millimeter uh, eyepiece, and those numbers are written right on the side of the eyepiece, okay? You don't have to remember them. And then under that, um, I use a one and a quarter inch eyepiece, like the one I showed you just a minute ago, okay? So there's a substantial difference in size between uh, 1.25 and a 2 inch okay but again very good at uh, low powers wide field views and I think what you'll find as you get into the hobby and you've seen a lot of items that you're going to enjoy more a low power wide field view than a super duper high magnification view uh, which is what we usually use for planetary ob observation because the planets are very small and we got to get them as big as possible for the viewing conditions of the atmosphere, all right? But as you get into the hobby and you've been in it for a few years, I think you'll agree with me that you will begin to enjoy a low-power, wide-field view more than a super high magnification view. It's just something that happens to everybody that takes up the hobby. All right, now there's a couple of other items that, especially if you have a catadioptric scope, folded light, or you have a refractor, you're going to probably need what's called a diagonal. This is a diagonal, okay? This is a 1.25 inch diagonal, and this is a 2 inch diagonal, which just simply means the hole in it is 2 inches, and the hole here is 1.25 inches. That's all that means. But you get an idea of the difference in size here, okay? The 2 inch is much more heavy duty than the 1.25 inch. I mean, this happens to be a Williams Optics uh, dielectric 2 inch. Okay, it's much heavier 
than the little uh, Orion uh, 1.25 inch diagonal. But you're going to need these so that you can get your eye in a comfortable position. You know, if you just put the eyepiece into the back of your telescope and it was pointed straight up, you know, you, you would be way down here on the ground trying to look through it. Well, with one of these in there, you can put your eyepiece in here and just walk up to the scope and look in the scope. Even when it's pointed straight up, just walk up and look in, okay? And if it's pointed like this, you know, you just look down, okay? So these are called diagonals. And my advice to you would be simply spend the very little extra money and just go out and buy a dielectric coated uh, diagonal. And let's see if you can see that. See, it says dielectric on there. And that just simply means there's a mirror in here and it's got what's called a dielectric coating on it that reflects 99% of the light that hits it. Okay, 99% dielectrics reflect 99% of the light that comes in here, hits the mirror, bounces out. Okay, 99% of that is kept is uh, bounced off. So just buy yourself a dielectric. The coatings are very durable. That's the other advantage of a dielectric. The coating on the mirror doesn't degrade for decades all right so if you take care of these and have them sealed up like i do see both ends are sealed all right and that's stored in a, a bag which is zippered up and you take care of it it will last you literally for decades all right so it's kind of like a one-time purchase if you're going to be in a hobby because um Generally, with a couple of diagonals is really all you need for all your telescopes, okay? You can get by with a couple of diagonals for all your scopes that you might eventually own. So buy a dielectric, take good care of it, and that's really all you need to know about diagonals. Now, the final thing I want to show you is a little extension device. Uh, <clears throat> they make these in various sizes, okay, a little extension. Some folks with reflector-style telescopes cannot get an eyepiece to come to focus, and they, they need an extension adapter that's, that goes into the focuser first, and then the eyepiece goes into the extension in order to come to focus with certain eyepieces. So that might be another little accessory that you might have to buy depending on what eyepieces you have in order that you will be able to come to focus. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to turn around from the screen right now, and the reason I want to turn around, I want to show you uh, what you can find, uh, you know, how do we store all these? Is What kind of case do we have? Well, uh, there are cases you can buy on the Internet to store all your eyepieces. There's hundreds of different cases. What I like to do myself is uh, there's a very nice thrift store, Goodwill-type store, here in Rockwall, Texas, and I usually go back and look around in the luggage section to see if there's something there that uh, I might be able to use to store my equipment in. All right, so uh, let me reach back here and get it. So, one day I was roaming around in the thrift store, and I looked up, and they had an aluminum case. Now, the outside, <clears throat> you could tell, had been, uh, 
used. This case has been used, but it was one of these aluminum type trays, all right? And what I did was I went and bought some foam and put it in the top, okay? And just used some foam glue in the back to glue it up there, all right? And then uh, it had these dividers already in it, kind of padded dividers. And the bottom had padding on it already. And the sides had padding already there. A little soft rubber padding already in there. So I used this to store various equipment that I have in this box. Nice aluminum box that I paid $3 for at the Goodwill store. So... You know, start hanging out at the Goodwill store, and there's no telling what you might find there that you can use to store your accessories in. Uh, let me get the other case that I found and show you that case. And here it is. And look, it, it's a computer bag, okay? It's a computer bag, computer bag, and meant to hold a laptop. But what was neat about this one was it had these Velcro separators, these Velcro separators in it, and you can move them around and they stick together. All right? You can move these around, and I went, well, hey, I can make separate compartments for my stuff in this bag and it had some nice interior pockets it had an outside pocket this is actually my main field eyepiece bag that I take out into the field all right and it's very heavy duty nylon and it's got a lot of space I can put charts in here and other things and carry it right out in the field with enough equipment for that night, that night's observing. So, <clears throat> uh, again, I bought this at the thrift store, Goodwill store, for three or four dollars. All right. There seems to be an abundance of laptop bags at the Goodwill store. So, I'm sure if you go there. <laughs> And look around for a few days, you know, look one day, wait a few days, they get shipments in all the time of different things. And you and start looking in the luggage section or wherever they would keep the laptop bags. You, you can find yourself a very nice laptop bag with these Velcro separators in there. Foam separators that have Velcro on them and they, you can arrange them however you want and create a very nice uh, uh, eyepiece bag that you don't have to worry about much. It's heavy-duty ballistic nylon, and it's got this heavy-duty strap on it, you know, meant to carry a big laptop around. Targus uh, makes these type of bags, for example, you know, and they, they literally last forever. And you can go in there and buy one for just a very few dollars. This one was like $3. And use it for at least five, six, seven years uh, to carry your stuff out into the field. So let me put this down. And finally, the final uh, bit of tip I want to leave you with before we uh, basically say goodbye is uh, again you don't have to run out and buy all these things but um, a lot of them you know like the leveler remember the little leveler we talked about and this lens pen and this compass you know you just about have to have that kind of an accessory if you're going to get into the hobby. You're going to have to have it, all right? So um, 
make use of your local hardware store, your local thrift store, Goodwill store, and uh, remember on that diagonal, buy a dielectric, buy a dielectric and you won't be sorry. And until next time, I'd like to wish you clear skies. And like I usually say, keep looking up to find, see the greatest show on earth right over your head every single night. Clear skies, everybody. See you next time.